the art is. Um, my name is Storm Janse van Rensburg, and I'm senior curator here at the museum. Um, I'm very pleased to see all of you here. Thank you so much for joining us. We have quite a heavy conversation for so late in the year, but we think it still it is a relevant conversation. Um, it's something that I think is important for us to consider as institution and as practitioners. It's something that we grapple with um, successfully and unsuccessfully. Um, but I do think, yeah, for us to really talk about our local art ecosystem and democracy, access and space is important. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by a fantastic group of people here. Um, uh, but before I introduce them very briefly, I would just like to say that the conversation is live streamed on YouTube and it will also be recorded. So um, when you speak or want to um, engage, please make sure that you have a microphone in front of you so that we capture um, the conversation as best as we can. Um, on my left here immediately is Neo Maditla. Um, Neo is a writer, journalist and a cultural commentator, um, practitioner. Um, she's very interested in storytelling and the development of arts institutions on the continent and specifically in design and art. Um, has done incredible work um, over a long period of time here in Cape Town. I'm very, very sad to say that we are losing her, that the city is losing her. Um, she's relocating to Tuane um, in January. But um, Neo, thank you so much for your contribution. And it's really great to be able to, for our past to cross at this particular junction, actually thank you also for the support of Zeit Smoker. You have been um, part of the conversation right at the inception of this institution. So you've also seen it develop and grow in the last couple of years. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, then Haroon Gansali, who is an artist and activist. Haroon is currently in residence um, at the museum on the second floor um, with a project Line in the Sand. Um, Haroon's work has spanned, like I said, um, activism um, in a very kind of real and engaged way. He's been working in a public context um, very directly. He's also engaged um, the bureaucracy that we deal with in that process head on and very kind of actively. So I'll also be curious to hear more about that aspect of your practice. Um, Haroon is developing a project um, over time, so it's process based, and he'll be here um, for the next month or so. And been spending time in the last uh, two months already at the museum. I'm also engaging with, with public. Um, and then a dear friend of the institution, Ashraf Jamal, um, Ashraf is a journalist, um, a academic writer, and cultural theorist. Um, he has also written quite extensively about our exhibition Upstairs, Homeless Where the Art Is, a beautiful review that also critically looked at what it means for us. So, yeah, that's um, the kind of our guests, the um, conversation um, we are going to keep quite informal. Um, I have a couple of questions for our panelists. But uh, yeah, uh, like I said, it's really important for us to really think about institutionally what it means. So with this exhibition, and also I want to say that Haroon's project is a parallel and connected to this. His, the invitation for Haroon to join us is part of the conception of the, the project as well, to have this uh, living um, part of the, the show that's not static and that's changing. Um, but what does it mean for a museum to ask its immediate um, as Koyoko says, interlocutors, the Cape Town in public, an artist, to, to bring an object to the museum. Um, the decision, why is it important? Um, and for us, the kind of conversation to be able to do that was, uh, on many levels, I think, something that we instinctively kind of approached and then kind of like in the most beautiful way, completely overwhelmed by. Um, and as many of you who have seen the exhibition can attest to, just in terms of space, what it means. Like what does it mean for us to give, you know, 2,000 square meters to the public for three months when many institutions don't do that? And also institutionally, does that really equate to democracy? Who gets to bring a painting to the museum? Who can access those spaces um, easily? But we've had some wonderful stories and engagements in that process too. Um, and space, you know, kind of we're sitting in um, some of the most 
valuable property on the continent um, having this conversation. So should you also consider that um, when we have these conversations? So the prompt to you, um, and I'm going to ask each one of you just brief remarks to start off with. Um, a prompt about maybe directly about the exhibition itself of what it means, but in terms of your own practice and your own kind of work, what does democracy, access, and space means? And Neo, I'm going to ask you to 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 kick off. Thank you, so. So my, I guess, history with Cape Town is that I've worked here for the longest time as a journalist, right? And I've been kind of, you know, I guess, engaging with the city from a perspective of a journalist who is trying to, you know, understand how democracy is applied in the city and obviously, you know, very unequally, right? Like I've worked in daily newspapers, I've worked with kind of like artists and maybe over the past couple of years, more like as part of institutions than trying to, you know, like how do we get more people interested in, you know, design or architecture or art, or any of these kinds of things. And so I think it's a very, I mean, big um, question, but I also think that like um, for me, you know, the show upstairs, what it has meant is that, um, yeah, it's the first time where I felt um, the Zeitzmoka reaching out to Cape Townians, um, and not just specific Cape Townians, you know, not just Cape Townians who are artists, not just Cape Town, well, obviously Cape Townians who are artists, but like not just the immediate like art community, but just kind of like anyone who thinks they're an artist can submit their work. Um, and working through the exhibition, the work that, you know, for example, like stuff from like kids, right? Like little kids' drawings and the kinds of like photographs that people sent and the kind of stuff that I definitely, um, you know, as someone who, again, is in the industry, never come across in institutions like that. I felt like it was very, yeah, like it, I didn't expect an opening exhibition like this, but I think it was a, it was a good surprise, and I think it was, um, yeah, like a much needed message from such a huge institution on the continent in the world to sort of like open itself back up after or even during the pandemic um, by first welcoming, you know, the residents of the actual city in which it exists. Because I don't think, yeah, that's something that has always, you know, where people have always felt like. This is the museum, so to speak. Thank you, thank you, Neil. Hi, Arun, jump off. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think I'll start off by saying I never really expected to be on a round table, or a seat at a table, or I never asked to be at the table. I always thought I would be a bit of an outsider artist. I started as a graffiti artist, and I, I thought that's really where it was going to be, and somehow I did get sucked in through the gallery system and propped out here on the other end 10 years later. Um, and it's been a hell of a ride, but it's very interesting to be in this place here. Um, also because it's been the first time that I've been able to see people's responses to my work. I mean, that's not something you generally receive as an artist. Normally like the gallery or the curator or the museum or the, the front of house or the tour guide, they see the reaction to your work. And that's been a hell of a privilege, actually, to, to be engaging with the public and to be eliciting responses, you know? Um, and I, I, the, the most interesting response, which is also the most, the response I've received the most, is actually challenging the fact that I was invited where it's adjacent to a show where people can submit. And that is like a, a big challenge to say, well, how can you have a show that's all about democratizing the museum and then you have a parallel process of a residency or a studio process and I was invited, there was no open call. And you know, that closed open question is something we have to grapple with and it's something that I've had to be grappling with and I, I, I don't know really what, what my answer is besides, well, do you really want to be here? You know, and, um, and um, sure. Um, yeah, 
uh, I think I will just, that, that's my opening remark, is I suppose that it's been so far quite a ver an interesting process to elicit responses and yeah to be challenged as why am i part of the the i suppose the system that keeps people out mm -hmm. within this moment of trying to open the doors up yeah thank you Ruin. and i think it would be good to continue this conversation but i would like to yeah. go to ashraf and then we can come back to it because it, it a great prompt for me thank you um, first of all, um, good evening to everybody. Um, I'd like to take on the, the actual core notions that are driving this conversation, democracy, access, space. And when I look at all of these words, I hit a brick wall because we well know at this point in the 21st century that basically democracy is shot. We are confronted by ascending fascisms worldwide, by extremism, by populism, the complete negation of an inclusive vision of society. In terms of access as well, historically in this country, but not only, um, it's always been a problem in terms of who has the right to access and, who access and who does not. And space, we very graphically know in South Africa, you know, if one just goes to the 1913 Natives Land Act, you know, when the, um, the majority of the land was apportioned to a white minority. And we're still living with the, the, the drastic fallout of that, which is not only economical, it's psychological, it's emotional, um, and also egregiously and understandably political. So all of those words are complex. Um, I, make, I make this point firstly because I want to make a completely counter-argument if one look at the history of museums, which is very much a 19th century phenomenon, um, they were initially designed to give the working classes access to art. And the idea of a Sunday repast, you know, it's not just sport, you could take the family to go and see a museum. The idea there was that those who were comparatively uninformed, those who were, were work, working too hard, those who did not have access to learning, could on a weekend have access to culture which raises the issue, culture has never been democratic. As a concept, you know, um, and if you look at it historically, and certainly look at the last 300 years of Western civilization and the construction in literature or in fine art, the idea of the canon, of canonization. Now, my point is not simply to contest canonization, you see, but it's to understand how it comes about and how we as a society get to revere and value certain artists at the expense of others. There are gains and losses in this process, but I'm not intrinsically, intrinsically going to damn it. This is the issue, and right now, at this moment in our history, I was just this morning, I was going through my phone, and I came across the VC of uh, UCT, uh, Mamogeti Fakeng, and she's speaking, and she says, what she's trying to over override, and I was thinking about what Storm's trying to do. She, she speaks about an exclusionary constitutional culture. Now, the word that I stopped and paused that was how constitutional, because we celebrate the fact that we have one of the most inclusive constitutions in the world, and yet now we are dealing with the tension between exclusion, the constitutional culture. How do we mesh all these different competing drives? And she says she wants to build a university where everyone feels that this is their university, which is the whole idea of Zeitzmacher in terms of trying to create a vision of a, of a museum that is truly genuinely inclusive. Question is, I believe that principle makes sense in terms of how one engages the general public. But it doesn't make sense in terms of the infrastructure of an institution itself. My point is this, elitism is not so easily over overwritten. Do you see the paradox and the tension? Because while the recent exhibition, Home is Where the Art Is, was a wonderful, and I was very, very, my hairs are standing on end. I was so excited to be a, a part of that space. But I saw it as an anomaly. I didn't see it as a normative condition. I saw it, as, and I saw it something as symptomatic of a deep inward crisis we were all experiencing <laughs> as a consequence of COVID. What do we do? Uh, you know, testing our viability, our ethics, our morality. What is good for a society? So it was a response 
a very, very genuine and heartfelt response. But I don't believe at the expense of the fundamental conception of what museums are. And I know this, and I know you might think I'm an elitist or an extremist in the positions I'm taking. That is not what I'm saying, because my argument is we need to address, reflect, and change the canon. But one will never override the fact that there are certain artists who will deserve our attention and others that won't. But at the same time, we also need to be genuinely inclusive in terms of how we integrate um, in a very diverse um, society in South Africa, where many people haven't, been, haven't received the kind of training, for example, as myself or my fellow m members on this panel, who don't have that immediate access. How do we create that access? How do we make spaces um, warm and inviting? Forgive me if I'm speaking too long. No, just please, please carry more on. Points. Is that all right? Uh, absolutely, um, thank you. And you know, one of the ways I, I was thinking about this issue, is there's a book that I really love by John Armstrong and Alain de Botton called Artist Therapy. And I've used it on many, many occasions. For some reason, <laughs> it's the book I seem to quote more often than any other. It's like, oh God, I've got to write about this. The book that's most immediately accessible on my desk. Why? Because it's a warm, loving book, and, and it, it talks about what art should do. Um, art should commemorate, should give hope, should dignify suffering, should rebalance, guide, inspire self-knowledge, communication, expand horizons. Now, that is the vision I saw at work in the Zeit's um, curatorial pro well, well, it was unjuried, but also bizarrely curatorial, because even though it was unjuried, insofar as all works were accepted, Decisions were made about where works were hung and how they were hung in relationship to which other works. And the thematics that I, when I listened to the curator speaking seemed to very much echo the very arguments that Armstrong and de Botton were saying. This is, and understandably, because we need to commemorate, we need to give hope, we need to dignify, we need to inspire self-knowledge. It's all important. The key thing though, all of those issues, to what extent are these issues social issues or to what extent are they individual issues? There's another paradox, because democracy is the enshrinement of individualism. Mm -hmm. But how does one embrace individualism in a society where the rights of the human have been so catastrophically subtracted? Mm -hmm. So there's another of the many paradoxes I see myself working with. How does one work against the art canon, but also find a way to engender um, and create value within it? Another paradox. Um, they say, um, Armstrong and, I'm almost done, <laughs> they say Armstrong and de Botton that high art, the art we suppose we revere, is disconnected from my inner needs. I could say, I could see where they're going, but I don't wholly believe that to be the case. I don't believe all contemporary art is disconnected from the human need that we need to answer. So how, again, do we reevaluate that? And how, and I think this is the point that Storm is trying to deal with, how do we deal, he, he spoke about the, the real estate, you know, where we're actually located, we cannot deny that. But then how do we therefore reconcile patronage, ideology, money, education, and museology? Mm. How do all these, these things work together um, is another issue. Um, is I would just leave it at that in terms of some of my opening thoughts, and um, I hope that's been clear enough. But that you understand that I'm speaking, I'm sitting in two seats simultaneously. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashraf, and I think it's, that's exactly, it articulates uh, what Haroon mm. just said now, exactly what you called that paradox, you know, the, the certain desires and self-introspection that, but yeah, the, the two, two things un maybe uncomfortably live next to each other. But I also want to think about our cultural spaces that we, and I, I'm not saying that this is what you're doing, but that we see that one thing negates another, or that because this is important, that doesn't matter, you know, that we need to see these all as maybe a piece of, uh, and sorry, it's a, it's a really th a silly analogy that I sometimes use, a simple one to say that if we think about this as a piece of music, if everything was the same note and the same kind of, you know, tonal value and loudness, it would be unbearable. So we also kind of like trying to make music in some way and address it. So we also need to see the Cape Town, we also call it the Cape Town Exhibition, um, Homeless Where the Art Is, in relation to the work that's happening institutionally with our Centre for Art Education, or the conversations that happen and the generosity perhaps that we 
in, in gender, and so uh, I'm not making a defense here, but also the conversations that may be happening on social media. Um, so these things are kind of like, yes, I think, but but I would argue that we we don't see them as necessarily completely opposing. And of course, they have this friction, as you articulate, Arun, and you also in a very personal way, you incredibly exposed to, at the same time, as much as you have access to it, you're exposed to kind of a very particular publicness of the work or kind of, or to a public. Uh, museums should not be necessarily confused as public places of public culture. I think we also need to be careful about articulating that. We also places, as we say, of exclusion and surveillance and, and all kinds of other things. But that's my immediate response to you, Ashraf. Thank you for that for that wonderful prompt. And I don't know if you, Naya or um, Haroon has a response to that or more, more thoughts on it. I want to maybe, Haroon, I think you more I mentioned a little bit earlier in the introduction, but I think I would like to hear a little bit more about <laughs> also, or if we can, you can speak a little bit to your work that has been in the public, in public space, meaning um, bureaucratized public space, of course, um, in some of your interventions or most of your work, has that interaction with the outside world or kind of the cultural artifacts that live in, cult in public spaces. And then you've also negotiated that kind of administrative bureaucracy that surrounds it into a kind of a practice that's incredibly hands-on and involves yourself very directly, um, often through acts of labor or an engagement that's physical. Um, I can name many examples of that. But then that also is a mediation into the kind of gallery museum space. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? some of that experiences and because I think that for me ties some of these questions together about the conversation. Thank you. I'd, 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 I love your, your, your prompt. Um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us back 10 years ago and take us to a cannon, a cannon that's walkable distance from where we are now. It's on the Signal Hill in Cape Town and it's a cannon it's a, it's a British cannon. It's been going off every day besides public holidays and Sundays for like 200 years. Now, this is a, 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 a public gesture, which on the one hand reminds you that it's 12 o'clock, but it also at the same time reminds you who's the boss. It reminds you that there's an ever-present, you know, still a colonial grip on you and that there, there will forever be this cannon that will blast and will remind you that there's another presence somewhere. It's almost, it's, it's, it's quite psychologically jarring if you really think about it. And when you're in this building at 12 o'clock, it goes Pah! It's amazing. When, when you're in Athlone, where I'm from, you hear it at 12 o'clock. It's, it's something that is so pervasive in our mentalities, but we accept it as something that's just, you know, c a meaningless act of, of public culture. But at the same time, um, you know, it really needs to be questioned. And when, when I say, let's take you back to 10 years ago, I was with a group of people who tried to stop the cannon. And we positioned ourselves in front of the cannon without asking permission. This is, this is one of the, the, the illicit acts of actually questioning uh, something and by nature not asking for permission. And um, there we were, like 11.58, like lined up in a, in a, right in front of the cannon, two, three meters, socially distant, but staring it down. And the, the, the Navy official came to us and said, you're not allowed to be here. Please get out of the way of this cannon. We have to fire it. And we just lay down, and the cannon went off, right? We didn't manage to stop it. We were totally defeated in our, in our, our try to question this colonial monument. And, and the, the, the logic would be, if we had stopped it, we would have been memorializing the action of stopping it because it would be the only day in its history besides a public holiday and a Sunday where it would not have gone off, right? Totally traumatizing. I can still, every time I hear it, I think, oh, shit, fuck, we, have to, ah, we still need to stop that thing. But <laughs> other people love it, right? And um, I'm, I'm going to jump forward a few years because I was... Very much, I'm very much from here, 
right? I'm, I was born and raised in the Cape Flats. So, you know, y your, your perspective of where the heck you're going to get to, it doesn't really extend beyond the sea, right? That's like a, a hell of a limit, right? And then that side, it's like a line in the sand, really. You, where, where are you going to go? Still on Bosch? No. You're in the Cape Flats. That's your life. So I, I was understanding how we got there, and we got there through group areas and like the whole of the, the violent history of the past, and what do you do about it? You're a young person now, you're living in a democracy, quote unquote, what does that mean even? And, 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 and you're living in a politically isolated place, right? That's constructed, like the canon is, to keep you perpetually inferior, to keep you there in the dormitory of, a, of apartheid, right? And I, um, call it single-handedly, but actually I had a friend who helped hold the ladder, just changed all the road signs in District 6 as an action of like memorializing all the people who had been moved, not just from District 6, but all of the areas that line the lily white suburbs of, of, of Cape Town, right? It, it was colorful and now it's lily white and it's still lily white freaking two decades after the end of apartheid in so-called democracy, guys. Right? And almost 10 years later, I've recently asked the city, I've, as part of this process, I've, I've, I've approached the city and asked them if I could have, if, oh, no, it's not I, if we can have these, is this working? Yeah. I don't know if YouTube can hear me, but yeah. let's, let's hope. Um, I asked the city if we can have access to these road signs, because what they are, is they're, they're like the actual artworks, right? Or they're the actual objects that show that if you are dissatisfied with, with the shortcomings of a democracy, you can make a change. You can actively say enough is enough, I'm gonna make this art, but that art can remain in the cities in, and in people's perspective and it can actually do something. But I was turned down by the city. Very interesting, it's kind of like a turning point in like where you know, the hopes and dreams of the young activist just get <laughs> shattered in one go. And the, the, the city said, no, you're an artist, you should make your own work. Hello. No, actually, you know, um, particularly when you're talking about these sorts of things, about access, about change, you know, you'd hope that your city would be encouraging young people to just take a stand, right? And that object would not be for me, my art. No, it would be to be put into a museum like this, with all its contradictions, for the, p the purpose of inspiring other young people to just say, cool, where's the problem? Make a difference. And that, that like, disjuncture, right, is what we, wha what we really have as a problem. We have, you know, governments who don't really care. In fact, the opposite. That we have governments that actively stop transformation, right? We have city officials that, 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 that look at you in, in contempt when you ask them to cooperate and you tell them, guys, this is going to be a feel-good story for the city, and they just say no, right? There have been a f couple of other projects that I have had cooperation from the city, but, you know, these two really do help to sort of show um, ah, a, a bit of a prick, a, a thorn in the side, right? Um, I can give one example of something that I, I, I did get right, but uh, ironically, it's because I was able to leverage a much bigger invite, right, of, a, of an invitation to Venice. And I like, uh, asked the city, three cities, for permission to um, recast uh, colonial statues, blood red, but like just the hands, right, because they're quite obvious, they have bloody hands, right, terribly bloody hands, and those hands haven't done any, any, any reparation. So, and I was surprised, like within three to five days and a lot of pressure, I got 12 government departments permission to, you know, reframe these monuments. And the, 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 the difference between that and a museum work is, you know, this is public art. It, 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 it when you approach it, you, it, it does something to you. So, you know, th there's not the access at a door, there's not an entry fee, you know, um, and without changing that, th these cities, or same cities, same governments, would be doing a further injustice to us, right? So that was one 
one that I was successful, but you know, the rest of it's been a bit of a, a, a tooth and nail cat fight. Uh, Harun and yeah, I, I, we've been you know so many conversations you know especially about the the District Six, um, and I know that it's been a, you know kind of a very difficult um, process in engagement with you and a, and a massive letdown, um, and also f to 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 see this in in a context then of a kind of a door shutting is 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 devastating. Um, Neo, I think you have also seen and understood the city of Cape Town um, in many levels, in, in, uh, and, and and maybe also have like this engagement maybe with the, the city itself, government-wise. <laughs> um, but maybe there's some insights from you as well as somebody who's also invited, um, you know, kind of critical voices to the city um, over a, a long period of time, and also seen how it shifts. Um, but do you have any comments about shifts in Cape Town or where, where, where are our blind spots or not so blind spots? Yeah, sure. I mean, I am, you know, from Tuani, I'm from Pretoria, but I think I've spent well, my whole adult life really in Cape Town and quite specifically my working life. And Cape Town is just one of those cities or quite possibly the only on the continent where I feel most unwelcome, right? And I say that in the sense of like, not specifically in terms of like spaces like this, but like, you know, if we all walk out of here and we go like, you know, to a restaurant or to a coffee shop or to whatever, like Cape Town is quite alienating um, to me um, as a, you know, as a young person, as a black person, as a South African, that it's been very interesting then having spent all my time here as a journalist where I then had to almost like navigate all these different parts of the city that I might not have been able to had that not been my entryway, right? Because if you're a journalist, you are, you know, you're off to a flood, you know, in an informal settlement, then you have to come to the Zides for a black tie affair, and then you're going to some place where people's houses are being torn down. And to an extent, I think it sort of like forced me to, yeah, like grapple with the idea that like the Cape Town, you know, tourist city, white beaches, all of that. Like the story that Cape Town wants to tell itself, that it wants to advertise to the world that it is, was not, you know, quite the one that I experienced. Like I experienced it sure because, you know, I'm of a certain career um, and so on. But also what you find, you know, and like what Harun is saying is that then you read as a like, oh, the district six that you read about in school is actually just here next to your house in Woodstock, but you know, there's no signage, right? So like district six is something that exists that you know, force removals, whatever, but there's no, you know, there's no evidence of it really. Um, in the city itself or in the story that the city um, tells itself sometimes. And, you know, one of the things that I've been most fasc fascinated about um, is also like Cape Town slave history, right? It's like, you know, you go to Zanzibar, all of those places, right? You learn so much. You go to, you know, Senegal, you learn so much about that history. You come to Cape Town and you're like, oh, but Cape Town has a very, you know, um, you know, it's been recorded like, you know, that is part of our history here. And you just kind of like, where do you have to go and you have to do the work? So I feel like a lot of what I know and understand about the city, the access that I got was through my career, right? And having to engage with governments, having to engage with the city, having to engage with organizations that I'm not sure what the average Cape Townian or the average tourist or the average, you know, like anyone else who doesn't have access to the kind of information that I've had, you know, like what version of the city, um, yeah, like they're exposed to and, you know, if, like how long we can continue if we say we all want to sort of like, you know, you know, live together or celebrate democracy or, you know, people always 
you know, sometimes asked, like, yeah, but how come, you know, young people don't feel this way? Like, well, talk to them, right? It's like maybe if you, I'm just one person who's just speaking from my perspective, but you can just imagine how many other young people with different kinds of histories that, you know, intersect with the city in all these different kinds of ways, what they feel like. And, uh, yeah, it's like once I feel you start having those kinds of conversation, then a, a very interesting picture of Cape Town um, starts to appear. But, yeah, I'm not sure if we're there yet or we want to get there. <laughs> um, if Thank we can. <laughs> I mean, I think, and that's the that's that's the work, that also that institutionally, we need to do. I have um, this this kind of two things for me that I would like us maybe to continue a little bit, and I think it's the one maybe is if we can continue a little bit on the conversation of the museum or institution, um, the the crisis in the museum, um, not only here not only um but also globally what the pandemic has generated my question is almost was that a crisis that was just kind of there looming and this has just accelerated a certain kind of like question um that's one one strand um yeah i think maybe this but yeah ashraf i don't know if you want to maybe pick up pick up on that Yes, I do, but um, just before, I can't resist but getting back to the noon gun. And when I was a kid watching spaghetti westerns, and if you remember, there's always showdowns on the dusty street at high noon. So basically, noon is a time that's very, very charged and, um, and, and quite a radical moment. It's a state of emergency, high noon, 12 o'clock. So the thing is, is where we actually are in terms of the state of emergencies around issues of democracy, around issues of access and issues of space. And what Nia and Haroon and yourself have been discussing is how do we deal with these issues which at one level are absolutely urgent, at another level seem hopelessly insurmountable because of a moral disingenuousness or falsity or split where People sound like something should happen that's good, but then something else happens contr contrarily. Contrarily. That's entirely different. My apologies. Um, but to bring it into what Storm wants us to do, and all those concerns that Nia and Harun are discussing, which are essential, are actually reflected in the debate that you want to actually focus on now around the crisis in museums. Of course, one of the major issues about it has been about canonization, has been about exclusivity, has been about um, charges of, against elitism. But this is what I find, and I'm sorry if I sound like so, so impossible in my argumentation. And I think Tandazani and I would, would happily disagree on these questions because we tend to very kindly and warmly disagree on matters. <laughs> For example, the, the, the turn towards you know, a women-centric or black artists, for example, is an inevitable and reasonable and understandable development at this moment historically, certainly in the Western world and here in Africa, it shouldn't be as major an issue, but it's here also a serious issue. This is, this is epistemic, it's symptomatic of the crisis, and need to answer the problem, the, the crisis in museums. And one of the answers to that is to shift the personnel, to focus the areas around those who have been historically disregarded and suppressed, and primarily women artists and black artists. Now that point is, is absolutely crucial. Um, but um, at another level, what I, I find is that sometimes there's a cynicism in the way these issues are addressed and adopted. I don't feel sincerity in the way that's being manipulated. I feel sometimes that it's expedient. So one has to manage these issues which are, which are just around, again, the toxicity that surrounds it and the opportunism that surrounds it. So in terms of the crisis in museums, one of the issues that you need to deal with is not only a question of now changing the brand or the look, but understanding infrastructurally and historically. See, whiteness is not only what people mistakenly think a question of skin color. Whiteness is an epistemology. It's a system of power. And if we understand it that way, you don't then target somebody because they're white. You're looking at a historical precedent and how that has evolved civilizationally. 
in the Western world, which we as craven colonialists have primarily inher in, in inherited a Western paradigm. We haven't, I'm part Asian, but I haven't drawn from that. I'm part African, I haven't drawn from that. What have I drawn from? What have, what have I, I was born in Cape Town like you in Athlone. But I mean, what, in, what is my knowledge of the world? My knowledge of the world is the West African coastlines, the slave trade, the, the Atlantic economy, Europe, and North America. It's not about the East. So our entire way of looking and orienting ourselves has to change. But that has to be done in a much deeper way, not simply a question of replacing a certain sort of racial quota or gender quota, but calibrating and rethink at every point why one is doing what one is doing. And this is why I began by apologizing, and I always have to do this, it seems, because I cannot take a position that, that's absolute in any position because I don't believe it's viable. So in terms of answering the questions, it's partially my answer. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, do you have a response, Arun or Noyo, um, specifically to that? I mean, I just want to not to digress too much because th this crisis in museums um, is also, of course, one that um, has to do with you know kind of loss of revenue streams for for most major institutions. A kind of, like you say, a, a kind of a understanding about who who's the audience. You know, kind of who who are we talking to. Um, and a kind of a reassessment. So my question is almost like, and I s also think larger culturally. Do we do we just see this moment and and understand the the kind of the crisis and the difficulty that has been brought on by the pandemic as just a difficulty that we need to to overcome, and it's going to be business as usual. We're just going to be wait for it to be right again, or is this really? a kind of a systemic moment or a kind of a place where there's real shift and real change. And there's part of me that would hope so, that we, that that is possible um, and that we, we could be different institutions. Um, but what needs to change? And is it, or is it just going to be a kind of a moment? Is the Cape Town exhibition, Homeless Where the Art, is just going to be this moment and then like you said, d business to usual, and that's the, of course, institutional question that we, that we kind of asking ourselves. Um, sorry, it's a little bit of like a broad, kind of lob, but I don't know if there's any response from from that perspective. Like maybe from your practice, Haroon, I don't know if you see uh, what the impact has been, for example, over the last couple of months and and the difficulties that's thr thr been thrown up. Um, can we really radically redo? Um, or do we just, is it just business as usual? Well, if I had to be true to my practice, I would ask the question of you. I would, I would say that then that's my responsibility to say, this is a great question that I would like to know how have you and how has Zeitz dealt with the, the crisis? In, you know, and there have been some institutions who are now like formally known as their previous institution and they, they, they're still continuing. And they, you know, but how how have how have you, as a uh, senior curator in in Africa's most <laughs> important <laughs> art is institution, dealt with this? It's it's honestly it's 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 a process. It's really to. I I think for us was we really in the beginning stages was also to mm. to to literally almost just pause and and reflect and reassess and do a, a kind of a in-depth research and a moment of real reflection and, and questioning. Um, kind of one, you many of you might know, but we, we tasked staff members to come up with a research question in the first couple of months and weeks um, and then had to kind of do a full presentation to, to other staff members uh, with case studies. and and. And my research question was, um, what is that smoker without a building? Um, you know, so our identity um, has been centered on the space. And suddenly, there's no building. But we still constitute it as an institution and a museum. So at that moment in the pandemic, you know, kind of, it was not clear when do we wi invite people back into a space? So what does that mean to not have a museum, a building, literally? 
um, but you're still connected to an incredible group of people and colleagues that has a connection and a thinking space um, that was incredibly valuable and beautiful. So in that process was also then to turn the kind of a very critical look inside. And maybe it's not possible to completely re-envision yourself or remake yourself because certain things has just been set in a very particular way. I cannot change the kind of bylaws that has get at this point that has led to a development like where we're sitting. Um, but there's agitation and conversations that we can have here that hopefully kind of contributes to that. But I think this notion of not having a building was kind of actually quite a liberating one. <laughs> um, and so then also some of the work that we have been doing was also to really think about the story, the history that we tell about this building itself. Um, Saki Krina, um, dear colleague um, here, has been spending, you know, kind of the last five months doing a deep delve into the origins of the building, um, the kind of, yeah, the labor practices that has led to its erection right through its redevelopment and revision. And those kind of like narratives has been neglected and undertold and not been spoken about. So we, we coming back, we kind of come back to those uncomfortable histories and it will be processes of putting it in the public. That's one way. These are really small ways of like engaging with it. Well, not having all the all the answers. I think um, the leadership of Koyokuo, I have to acknowledge in this kind of process. You know, she has been absolutely extraordinary from a very get go. Was for us to really also reach out to kind of like put out a hand, you know, to others or kind of like to make contact. To let's speak, let's talk. Um, let's have conversations, let's kind of keep this going. And if we then, a space then of, museums are places of gatherings, you know, like ultimately this is a museum. Um, they, they're places for people to come together and that's I think the strength. Whether we can again come back to changing the, an organization or changing an institution, I don't know. I think and maybe that is the perspective also that we come with some hopefully humility and a sense of uh, connection and some of that heartfeltness that you that Ashraf that you have spoken about that it's really an articulation and hopefully we do shift things in the longer term um, and I think the Cape Town exhibition Homes with the Art is um, I, I wanted to also maybe and it's a little digressing you the process of also organizing and making decisions and you know part of that process of Yes, it's all equal and everybody can bring stuff, but then a decision is made how and where it's hung. Um, it happened in a week's time, so <laughs> many decisions were made very quickly. But I think even in that process of organizing and organizing and making connections was incredibly powerful. I, I really see this as a highlight of, of my career, of being able to, to, to also let go of my own kind of like notions of taste and preference and you know what's good and what's not and the kind of like resistance that we've seen from well-known Cape Town artists that was invited to take part but didn't bring their work to the museum um, there's a whole story there as well but to kind of work with colleagues and actually in a process of organizing which museums and curators do and editing in some ways to kind of like create narratives but so many of it was there was just no time to really think about it a lot um, but in that moment, magic happened um, that I will never forget. Really extraordinary. And so that is the kind of like hope. I think it comes through in the exhibition that there is a sense of that we take this seriously. This is not an exercise uh, that is just about marketing and making, you know, getting people into the museum. That became an amazing plus. It was really this moment of saying, how do we, how do we, how do we celebrate the city? and its people. So, and I'm kind of carrying on and on here. But the one last thing to say about this exhibition is that we, um, yeah, this kind of decision of bringing an object to the museum by an individual is a powerful thing. Whatever we want to say about, you know, kind of museums in crisis or not, that somebody who lives in a suburb in Cape Town 
made a choice about bringing something, standing in a queue for two or three hours at the museum to see it on the wall and come back to see it. There's a symbolic, beautiful something that happens. <laughs> and I'm not sure how to completely articulate it. But so yeah, these are some of the questions. These are all kind of probes. They 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 kind of experiments. They they working with a, a group of, of 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 people with a community with thinkers like yourself um, as participants, hopefully, in this process of thinking about this institution or institutionally. Yeah, sorry, that was a little bit of a diatribe, but <laughs> Arun, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> See the museum. The challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of wanted to come back to to the things that we don't see, um, the way that that the kind of that history is inscribed into our physical spaces, which which, which we don't see. You know, so I often come back to to the, the remnants of bylaws and you know and kind of regulations and ways that that's unseen. And that excavation and uncovering, and I think hopefully also with this building history that we really looking into now as well, and kind of articulating that, we come to also a critical understanding of how something like this happens and exists. Um, yeah, I think we are in a, a very particular juncture in the city, um, and in South Africa, I think the notion of 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 crisis has been something that's also been articulated as as a kind of a you know, Koyo Koyo in one of our conversations said, you know, we in an environment that's bankrupt, you know, there's a bankruptcy um, and we have a responsibility to to work against that, um, to to mitigate against that, to to not only imagine alternatives, but to to realize alternatives and not only alternatives, but things that also replace old things. Um, Astrof, I don't know yes, if you want to. I, I, in response to what you're saying, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, is that one needs to basically connect the world rather than entrench differences is one of the fundamental drives and that is a moral principle and a psychological and emotional and political objective that I believe is crucial. You were talking about this building. Now, where we are, are literally in a revamped grain silo, I mean, so basically, this was a storage depot um, for food, which basically connected the Atlantic and Indian Ocean eco economies. You know, Nia was talking about being from Shwane, and, about, um, and, and there's a sense of being very much part of an inland world in that space, whereas um, Harun was talking about Athlone, in a sense, very much being part of a port city. So the key thing about South Africa, which makes us an interesting space, that we are both a terrestrial nation and we're also an aquatic <laughs> nation as far as our connections are defined by water as, as much as they are defined by land. And I think we often forget these intersections when we speak of nationhood because we entrench ourselves rather than find ways to understand what connects us to other people. This was the great democratic principle in, a, in the 1990s, which we seem to have lost utterly as we, we become more and more provincial and more and more isolationist. And the vision that you're trying to construct is one which doesn't only connect a Cape Town community, but basically I enshrines the idea of community as a global urgency. Because without it, we are not human. Um, we, we are loveless beings. We are isolated and cruel beings. And I think one of the key things that we need to do is, you know, when Neo is talking about, you know, a sense of access or lack of access in terms of what you could have, or what people might have when they look at this building architecturally and they wonder, can I go in? You know, how do we strip down those, those fears and prejudices and make spaces open is a major challenge. And as Storm was saying, is that something you just sort of do overnight at all? But the key thing I was also trying to bring in terms of the idea of real shifts and real change, which I completely endorse your argument, but at the same time, something that was said to me two nights ago has really shaken me. I mentioned about the, for those who are old enough like me, you remember that great moment in the 1990s with the unbanning of, of Nelson Mandela, the idea of a whole new promise. And then my friend from America said to me two nights ago, yeah, that's what they're feeling under Biden. But is it going to happen? Do you know what I mean? So that, that there's a terrible sense of uncertainty 
an anxiety that's rooted in any hope that one has, in any advocacy that one has to promote. So one has to be all the more vigilant. It's not about being cynical. It's about being open-minded, fair-minded, judicious, careful in every choice, life choice you make, because without it, you might fall into the traps that people like myself in 1990s <laughs> South Africa, but yes, you know, it's happened, it's happened, and it patently hasn't. And this is Harun's point, and that is Neo's point. And it's a point that goes back to a historical problem that's so deeply locked in, huh, which we can't seem to pull ourselves out of. But without Storm's optimism, how are we going to continue? <laughs> 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 Thank you, Ashraf. Um, Naya, do you have a, any comments on that? But uh, I, I agree with that, you know, because again, I feel, you know, Cape Town is one of the most beautiful cities on the planet. We should all be able to enjoy Cape Town, right? And I think there's a lot of people that, you know, feel um, that there is a way that we can. And I really find, like, you know, for example, what you guys are doing. And I guess that's why I'm always, you know, drawn to people that are at least trying to be like, yes, Cape Town is these things and those things and those things and how I feel. But how do we make sure that it doesn't stay that way, you know? Um, because I just think. You know, we also, yeah, we can't just be like, okay, well, you know, that's it. Well, moving right along. And then not do anything because then that's how we make sure that nothing changes, right? Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, yeah, Liesl Hartmann, our head of art education, um, has said one of her mentors um, has said that her, the role of her as, a, as an art educator is to remove obstacles. You know, and so how do we remove obstacles? Um, and it's a challenge. It's not easy. It's a it's a it's a constant constant work. Um, that said, I also controversially want to sometimes just remind ourselves that museums also has limits about what they can change. Um, but we also, you know, that I think we need to also inherently understand our power um, and and what we can wield. And Harun, that's a conversation that we also still need to seriously have um, in, a, in a beautiful way. I think I would like to just ask if we, if there are any questions or comments from, from any of you. Um, yes, please, just make sure that you get a microphone. Um, I'm going to ask Tammy to, to, to run the microphones. Harun, I hope you noticed that I didn't give you an opportunity to respond. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, sure, thank <laughs> okay. you. Um, my name is Sarah. Um, I, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. And there were so many different points, so I'm going to try and just keep it really... It's more of a, um, an observation that I've had, uh, having moved here f about five years ago. And uh, my work uh, centres around the Muslim community in Cape Town, and I am working on my PhD where I'm researching the visual culture of... visual literacy of the Muslim community. And I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that have come forth through that research and some of the things that have come up. And a lot of it does center around inclusion and, and how they feel excluded in the most obvious way. And some of the things that have come up in, in terms of them not being included in collections and not being visible and being such an integral part of the history of South Africa and Cape Town particularly, um, and I've worked within the community, so I've kind of, I started on a superficial level and kind of edged forward slowly and started to uncover more and more things. And it really, really highlighted how much disparity there is. And I think conversations like this are really important, especially if they're really uncomfortable, because there is a lot of racism in the, in the organizations. And I've worked in the art industry now here in Cape Town for the last few years. And there really is a lot of racism, and that's something that has to be addressed. Um, institutionally, it, it exists. So we can have these conversations and say that this change is going to happen. And I think that the exhibition that happened was fantastic. And there were people that had never had the opportunity to, to have their work seen. So I've recently been working a lot with... Um, you know, there's an entire underground movement of, of Muslim arts going on that never gets seen in the public spaces. And one of the things that comes up a lot is that there's this high art that you were speaking about, this high art and this low art, and how we set these standards, and who sets these standards. So my question is, who are the decision makers? And I think until those things really are addressed, and those spaces are opened up, 
then that inclusion just becomes a superficial conversation because is that real change happening? And I've been in this city for about five years um, and I moved here from London. I come from East London. It's a very migrant community. And, you know, we have access, we have the advantage of having access to museums for free. And that's another thing that comes up is that many people I've spoken to, they can't afford to attend the museum. Even though there is a Wednesday free day, most people work on a Wednesday. So there's little things that, although they may seem they really d we have to understand a lot of people in the city don't have enough money to be able to afford a ticket and things like that. So really on that level, we have to really be honest about... Sorry, I've gone on. <laughs> but no, that's I, I feel really... Um, I think just from my own conversations, having learning, it makes me quite emotional because it's heartbreaking. And I get asked questions as a curator and a writer. What does a person have to do to have their work included? You know, are, is our work not good enough? And things... And it's I don't know how to answer that question sometimes because how can I explain that some of the decisions that are made are very commercially orientated or, you know, there's a lot of those things. And so when we say being honest, you know, we have to be really honest. So, yeah, that's just... What thank I you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Um, appreciate that. And I think absolutely. Um, the uh, It just prompted me to... Your statement just prompted me to also for us to really maybe think and talk a little bit about ecosystem. You know, what we think about, you know, the museum as part of, uh, you know, other things that surrounds it and and that we understand the art scene in Cape Town as a set of sometimes problematically interconnected things. Um, you know, the we, we know how problematic the, the art, art scene is and can be and how how the commercial, you know, kind of, commercial galleries operate um, and the kind of priorities for that and even kind of with the and how stratified um, the scene is here and yeah I think we have a lot of work to do um, and again I think you know the Cape Town exhibition Homeless Where the Art is is, um, is one it's 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 one attempt um, and yeah, I, I, I'm, we're also grappling with like, do we do it again? You know, what is the next? What is the next step? What do we? Where do we take it further? And we don't necessarily have an answer. But thank you for your for your statement. Really, really appreciate it. And also to kind of address the issue of racism, um, you know, that we that we um, that that's experienced um, in the city and in the art scene particularly. Um, Haroon, I don't know if there's any specific responses to that. Um, Ashraf, you, you. There's something, may I? Yeah, please. Um, one of the things you mentioned that really intrigued me, um, I remember I began by talking about the museum as a 19th century invention. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is interesting in terms of, you talked about the enormous attendance at art museums in Britain. It has a lot to do with the Red Brick University, basically with the change in British culture in the 1960s, and also a greater emphasis on the humanities and the rights to, the, to access to the humanities across the class barriers. So in terms of the domestic attendance, obviously there's a huge international attendance, at, attendance let's say, at the Tate, but generally across the, the UK, at various museums, that aspiration is deeply, deeply um, locked in, and it's got a lot to do with education. Mm -hmm. Now the key problem we have here is that our institutions are not allowing for that integration. It's not seeing the value of the arts. Our government isn't, you know, they're cutting back on art, arts training at high schools, you know, and but also what's happening in terms of there's a privatization ethos inside universities around tertiary, tertiary understanding of what art is. So there's no radical sort of inclusive vision built into the educational models at tertiary level. And therefore, people don't have the aspiration of a need. And outside of that space, you know, um, what other forms of access for the general community can there be that inspires them that says, yes, I want to come to museums? What sort of night schools are being developed? Or you know, what kinds of all kinds of other training? Because the only way we create the vision and the culture you're talking about is if we actually do something about our educational programs. And that leaves a lot to be desired at this point in time. And I should say, I've taught the last eight years, I retired two years ago at CPUT, so I've taught at Stellenbosch, UCT, Rhodes, but I chose in the last eight years of my teaching life to teach um, comparatively underprivileged students um, who did not have the obvious access, 
and basically engage with them around many, many debates around design, around culture, around uh, uh, value and the arts. And to push them, bring them, I brought them here on many occasions, you know, to, to, to come be a part of the space. And this is just one person, but it needs to happen across the board. That's just what I wanted to say. To Thank you. Uh, Harun, did you want to say anything? Sorry. I yeah, th I mean, the only thing... Can we get uh, the mic working here? Yeah. The only thing I want to add to that is that w you, you addressed the money flow, and we have to speak about that because it's the white elephant in the white elephant. <laughs> it's impregnated with a white little white elephant. So there's no free Wednesday. The museum's open from Thursday to Sunday. So the free Wednesday that did exist, that was part of like the public arm, uh, doesn't exist. But that's complex. One, because Wednesdays, who's here? As you said, unless you're unemployed, which are the people that maybe need the free Wednesday, uh, what are you doing on a Wednesday and how are you able to come to a museum? But the other point of the matter is that and this comes also to the crisis of the industry within which the museum finds itself, is that it also survives of ticket sales. And that is an exclusionary device, because if you actually think about it, 200 rand is a heck of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. If you are poor, say for example, on a Sasa grant, um, which is our kind of state support, it's a few hundred rand. You're not, not going to spend that on, on, on coming into the museum, no. Hell, hell no. And I mean, we're in a pandemic, so like the, the meager income people did have, hand to mouth, is like literally still hand to mouth. This is like a completely foreign concept. Even those who would, in the next month, spend their little bit of, of savings, now that, that work is knocking off and they have time with their families and they'll come to the waterfront and they'll have lunch. And then d you ask yourself, are you going to buy your whole family tickets or are you going to maybe get the same price of a pair of pants, which is going to last you and it's going to keep you comfortable and it's going to do something for you, or you're going to buy a ticket to a museum. I tell you, you're going to buy the pants. So we have to address this. And I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm also thankfully um, here as a representative associated to the museum, but I don't have the say to say, yeah, you can come visit me on Wednesday, I'll be here. But the rest of the museum is closed. So, you know, we have a problem here. <laughs> and I mean, look, uh, look, uh, let me address a secondary level, because if you've come through that door, if you pay or not pay, there's a donor's board. And on that donor's board, there's companies and there's the mega wealthy, and come on, where's our endowments? Why must these institutions be paid for by us? No, they should be paid for by them, the them that does exist. So if that's like, you need to add six more people or like more names on the different entrances, or I don't know what the solution is, but like, come on, man, like, you guys can help us. No, it's not us to tell you to help us. So that's the only thing I have to add to your great question, Sarah. I, I've written, I feel like I'd, I mean, need to respond a little bit. Um, just context, and I, I totally hear you. Um, we did away with opening the museum seven days a week um, because it, it's unaffordable to run the museum. Um, like I said, we, we lost about between 60 and 70 percent of our income since March. Um, there has been, of course, austerity measures in the institution um, that has affected most, most staff member salaries. Um, the uh, context is, is that we also currently, even just like opening four days a week, are pretty much at about 20% of our normal um, kind of figures, visitation figures. Um, so yes, it's, um, it's not even, you know, there's not even a breaking even situation, even with four days. So I hear you. It's totally, you know, kind of what is fair and what's not, you know. Um, and it's a vexing question for us as well. And so we're reevaluating this. Um, there's massive efforts going on also for finding support. Um, we've lost two major corporate sponsors um, right at the beginning um, of lockdown. Um, literally at the points where contracts were going to be renegotiated. Um, so the kind of timing has been really, you know, it's actually affected us on, on that level too. Um, in terms of the kind of support and, and further fundraising, there's been ongoing efforts. And so 
it is you know it is definitely it's it's a matter of survival um but you you're right like why we should have more easy access to the museum and there are diff different levels that we've we've tried and to do that and one of them was to give every person that brought an artwork access to the museum for multiple entries um if you buy a ticket now um you know in this period you also would have multiple entries it would be valid it would be a mini membership um valid for multiple entries um our memberships um of course it's still it's 290 rand um, but it's a year access to the museum at any point. So there's ways that we've also been trying to 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 be accessible. Um, but yes, this aspect of being a museum, an institution, that means that we exclusive. Yeah, that's the, also the nature of of the institution. And how to challenge that is really the big question. Um, I don't want to. Yeah, over here. Sorry. <laughs> ah, thanks, Tom. Thanks. Um, so I've, I've been following the, the, the roundtable discussions for the past three weeks. It's really interesting with the institutions that are in Cape Town and the politics surrounding it and now also the democracy access and the space issue. So I'm an artist and for me to be part of Home is Where the Art Is is something great um, because I wouldn't normally have access to, to the site's marker and um, I know that art galleries don't make money. Essentially, most art galleries don't make money. So it's very difficult for, for gallerists to actually have a product that sells like a brand does, such as Nike or Ferrari. So um, for gallery and for that market, as you said, some it's something difficult to bring in clients that actually want a product that they can show off to their friends when they go out to dinner or to the mall. So um, the issue with that is I've created something that I brought to the museum and I'm glad to be part of the exhibition and I'd like to be part of more upcoming exhibitions because I've created artwork that you can take out to show people easily, exchange with people. Um, so it's, it's, it's small, it's meant to art, but it's, it's, it's small, so you can check it out, show people easily. So I've brought that to the museum. I wouldn't normally have access to, to a museum such as Sites Market, and so what I think most galleries are trying to do, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, and that's also a question to you guys, is to actually have a, a company that has a brand that sells um, a building that that is, let's say, Nike, that sells its brand, and people are coming in to buy a brand all the time and not something you're trying to figure out how to sell. So I think that's what Sykes Mark is trying to do. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm happy to be part of the of the exhibition and any other future exhibitions because I would know I'd be out on the street otherwise. Okay, sure. Thank Thanks you very that. much. Okay, really appreciate that 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 comments and and thank you for your your participation. Um, it's been really incredible to to have this response. Um, I kind of want to wrap up. I don't know if there's any um, final comments from from anybody um, on your on the panel. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, thanks for inviting us. And I think this was a very um, fruitful discussion. And I'm sure the discussion will be, you know, happening um, a lot more going forward, I do hope, because we really do need to. But yeah, I mean, like, these are very big questions that, you know, there was absolutely no way we can handle everything in an hour and a half. But... <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it's the beginning because I don't think there is that much institutional humility, you know, in the city. And I think Zaitsmok is something that is so huge in Cape Town, but also just like a museum of um, contemporary African art on the continent. You know, you guys are choosing to lead and I think that's admirable. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Neil. Yeah, look, the only thing I want to add is that I do think it's been a very brave exercise of the museums to at least try to address these issues of, ac uh, of these issues that are not only 
this institution's problem. You know, um, I, d I don't agree with you that galleries don't make money. I think galleries make a shit ton of dirty money. This is not a gallery. This is a museum, right? This is a, 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 a space that is not necessarily for sale of art in the same way that a gallery profiteers of the commodification of objects, right? So there's a, there's a bigger purpose, there's an educational purpose, and there's fundamentally a, a, the need to make a change. So if, if I had to add anything, it would be that this is a great step forward, and I think that the next steps are going to be what's going to define this institution. I certainly want to support Harun's <laughs> argument there. The key distinction between what is a museum and what is a dealership. And museums are what all societies, healthy societies, must enshrine. And I believe this is what um, this institution is advocating, a vision which is pro in the process of coming into being to understand what a museum in the 21st century in Africa should be. On that note, I would say one thing. Recently, I had to um, assess the, the Johannesburg Art Fair. The reason I'm bringing that up is because what really struck me going through dealerships across various countries across the continent, but also the African diaspora in Berlin and Paris, etc. The one thing that struck me about African art was the incredible conviviality and warmth and generosity of spirit that the artists were communicating. That, for me, was indisputable. So I believe that the consciousness and energy of the continent is in many ways in league and <laughs> working with the Zeitzmacher vision to create spaces which are more kind, more generous, more warm, more humane. Thank you. No, thank you very much. And on that note, thank you again for joining us and wishing you a wonderful end of your year and festive season. Um, please, stay, um, s please stay safe. Um, and thank you very much again for joining us. Good night. <laughs>